Hi, I'm Jim Shaw, I'm back with another segment of Coffee with the Candidates. Today uh, I'm here with Joe Pato, who is finished, or just about finished, with two terms on the board and is seeking a third term. Uh, he's running unopposed uh, or uncontested uh, with, uh, for two, there are two candidates for two seats, um, and the other candidate is Susie Barry, who is currently the chair of the committee, so you two, both incumbents are running unopposed right. for a three-year seat. Um, if people are interested in learning more about Joe, I'll just say at the outset, you can go to his website, joepato.com. Um, this, as we talked about, you're running for your third term. Uh, you've been a town meeting member since 2008, uh, have lived in Lexington for 22 years. Uh, you served for nearly four years on the Appropriations Committee. Of course, I'm telling you this, you know this. Right. This is for the, for the benefit of our viewers. Um, you worked with the enrollment group, uh, which helped uh, gauge, in, uh, tell me about the enrollment group. So we Briefly. redeveloped the model for projecting enrollment. As you might remember, in 2007, yes. we started getting a rapid increase in enrollments, right. and the old models we were using weren't working really well to they tell us. They weren't accurate. Right. So right. Uh, we did a lot of work to develop new models. And that's helped. It is. Good. Um, and I said appropriations committee and town meeting. So. Um, Let's talk a little bit about some of your sort of um, meaningful, measurable accomplishments while you've been serving on the board um, in six years. I know there's a lot has gone on in six years, so um, maybe you can tell us a little, a little about some of the things that you worked on, uh, the consensus plan for the schools uh, that you, we talked about before we started taping, uh, other issues like that that you think um, that people should know about. So let's start with that. Um, yeah. When, when um, in my second year on the board, I became chair of the board and I served as for two years. And during that period is when we were really developing the plans for uh, accommodating growth in student enrollments. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, one of the things I did as chair was really drive the summit, which is the, uh, the board of selectmen, the school committee, and the two finance committees, appropriation and capital, to develop a consensus plan for what to bring to town meeting, what to propose, and get us on the path to the construction that we've been doing. And I was proud of, it's, it's a difficult process. You're essentially pushing string right. to get everyone to come yep. to a, a conclusion. And we were facing enrollment growth that wasn't giving us a lot of time. Uh, so coming to that consensus and being able to move forward is something I'm proud of. Another thing that, um, um, I've done a lot of work on and is our sustainability initiatives. Right. I've been the liaison to Sustainable Lexington from the Board of Selectmen and have been an active member of the Getting to Net Zero plan, developing the uh, Sustainable Action Plan and greasing the, the, mm -hmm. the skids for doing things like uh, our solar panel installations on buildings, the Hartwell Avenue ground mounted arrays. Um, those, those panels are generating net revenue to the town of over $400,000 a year. Really? Uh, so that's... That's real money. It's, it is real money. Our budget is over $200 million, Right. But $400,000 is, is a sizable chunk coming in. Sure. Um, we also you know, have done things like take advantage of a, a group electricity purchase for the town. So town residents are saved just about $2 million in the first 18 months. Really? That's something called a community uh, aggregation plan, mm -hmm. but it's um, it, it's something the state allowed, and we moved forward. And in purchasing for the town as a whole, we were able to secure both cheaper rates mm -hmm. that are 100% renewable sourced. So right. it, it's better for the environment. It's better for the taxpayer. How does somebody sign up for that? I mean, clearly, if we're saving two million dollars um, as ratepayers in the community, um, the, you know, that's a good thing. And significant. So, how do, if somebody's not on it, how do they find out more about that? 
So for most people, it just happened. Mm -hmm. um, so if you had, n the way you buy electricity is through um, what was NSTAR Eversource. Right. And the, um, uh, there is both the delivery charge and a supplier charge. And most people pay their bill, they don't look at the bill. It, it, so oh. the vast majority of the over 9,000 residential um, uh, account holders never selected a different supplier. So they were paying the basic rate that Eversource uh, had available. The, the community aggregation plan takes anyone who was on that basic rate and shifts them over to a different supplier and that price is cheaper than what the uh, Eversource basic rate. That's how we're mm -hmm. saving people money. So you didn't have to do it. If uh, you as a, a electricity buyer at home didn't have to go and, and, and uh, actively switch. Right. You could choose to buy from a different supplier and actively do that, but you are on the town's plan if it, by default. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really good. Um, and some of the- Does that, does that uh, is it just residents, is it commercial? It's commercial also. So we're actually over 10,000 accounts. Okay. Uh, over 9,000 right. are, are residential. Um, some of the larger commercial accounts they have active economists mm -hmm. financing, so they've gone right. off and purchased of large uh, contracts on their own. Right. But, but some, a lot of the smaller retailers, um, uh, small shops in town, they weren't. Local newspaper publishers? <laughs> Probably. I don't know what your bill looks like, but uh, okay. I'm guessing that you're, you were mm -hmm. switched as part of that town-wide. Yeah. Um, I imagine so. So I'm really pleased, and we, uh, yeah. we just renegotiated the next um, um, uh, two-year contract which again is cheaper now than mm -hmm. uh, what, um, what uh, Eversource's rates are. So, mm -hmm. so being fiscally responsible, looking for alternate sources of revenue, keeping ways of, of managing our budget is something I'm proud of. Similarly, I'm really proud of um, making sure that we as a community stay together. So when we have harder choices uh, where there's a v difference of opinion, I was very active in making sure that we would hold public hearings, public meetings, things like you know, people's concern over what the materials for the sidewalks in the center streetscape. That right. created a lot of controversy. It sure did, yeah. We held a lot of meetings and as a community kept from getting too polarized. Right. Not easy, but uh, and it's taken a lot longer time than I wish, but I think we will end up with a solution that is uh, mm -hmm. Uh, better and more acceptable. And that's coming to town meeting in spring. It is coming, right, in mm -hmm. um, uh, end of March, early April. I'm right. not sure exactly when, where. I'll so all of the work, I mean, the projects has been, some, and by some, you know, some people have said it's gone as long as 10 years trying to get to here. I don't know if that's true or not, but I know it's been a project that's been coming for a long time. It, it has. Um, you know, if you go back to the last comprehensive plan from 2003, there was already a discussion right. of the need to revitalize the center. Right. Um, and the revitalization is for a lot of reasons. One is a commercial, mm -hmm. keeping it fresh and active and lively. But for me, the most important reasons are safety, right. that we improve the traffic flow and improve uh, pedestrian access so that it's safe for everybody. Um, make it more accessible so that people with mobility challenges have an easier time making it through the center. Right. Um, and that we keep it the attractive living room that the t community as a whole views. Right. right. And when you say safety, I mean, we, we, people may not understand this, but we have a considerable number of um, pedestrian accidents. Not just automobiles, but pedestrians are significant. So we do. Um, uh, I think the first thing to remember is th something like the center is, has over 20,000 vehicles flowing through it every day. Right. So whenever you have that number of vehicles with a, 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 a right. good, healthy pedestrian uh, and bicycle uh, presence, yeah. you will end up creating right. the opportunity for accidents, and we certainly have. Yeah, and that's been, a, that's been somewhat addressed in this, in this new uh, in this streetscape design, which is better lighting. Right. Backlighting onto the subjects who may be entering the, the crosswalk, moving the crosswalks and doing different cutouts and, and so that, that people have some, there is a little bit more visibility when people are stepping into the um, into crosswalks. So I was pleased to see that. Right. Those were, were key drivers for the design to make sure that um, uh, pedestrian in particular areas were relocated to where they would be safer. 
right. uh, in how they come into contact with cars. So one of the problems we had in a number of places where drivers would turn right, right onto a pedestrian crosswalk when they're paying attention to traffic coming from their left. Right. Most of those crosswalks have been moved so that the pedestrian is visible to the driver and the driver's not turning onto them. Right. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. It's been a long process, as you said, right. and uh, uh, it will be up at town meeting for um, construction funding. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, let's talk a little, little bit about um, you know, the, the, the tax base. You know, we, we, you know, a great deal of burden has been placed on residential ratepayers. We've had to spend a lot of money. We've got, we had schools we had to bring up, um, mm -hmm. new schools. Um, we, you know, we finished Clark not long ago. Now we're sort of finishing Mariah Hastings. We're looking at the high school. We're also looking at a new police station. We're in the process of building the fire station. When you, I mean, when you look at it, I mean, the, the price tag just keeps adding, adding up. And, um, and the, because of that, the, you know, the, um, I think the differential used to be somewhere around 25% of the tax base was generated through com the commercial base, and now it's down to close to 15%. So I know there's a focus on trying to sort of bridge that gap a little bit um, and bring it back closer to where it was. And, and um, I guess it's a long way of saying we've got a project going that we're looking forward to on Hartwell Avenue, sort of a mixed-use plan. You know, I know that all of the, the stakeholders came together several years ago to change the FAR down there, but it really didn't take off for a lot of reasons. Um, most, most importantly, it just didn't go too far. So tell me a little bit about your thoughts about what's going to go on down there in terms of, you know, ho you're, you're, you're hoping that you're generating a little bit more tax revenue for the town and then um, the, um, the overall look of and feel of Hartwell Avenue. So a lot of issues there. Let me start okay. with um, the balance issue on taxes. Um, you're absolutely right that um, we have grown more and more dependent on residential taxpayers over commercial taxpayers. And that's largely because the value of residential property has increased much faster than commercial property. Uh, and as a result, that's we true. now are uh, below, eight, or about 18% of tax revenue comes from the commercial sector. The, um, um, so as a member of the board, one of our key initiatives is to look to how can we bring that balance back closer to what it was in the 1980s when it was near 30%. Right. And largely that is looking at how to make the commercial industrial zones, so there are two of them, the one on Hartwell Avenue and then the one over on Hayden Avenue by Spring Street. Um, how we make those more attractive for today's commercial environment. Uh, what we have out, especially on Hartwell Avenue, is office parks designed from the 60s where they're low, single story, maybe two stories, large parking lots, lots of space between buildings, not a lot of amenities. Um, and the result is that there are several vacancies. Not a lot has been built uh, in the last 40 years. In fact, we had our first new building in 40 years, uh, started about three years ago, two, two years ago. Um, and, um, and there's been a stagnation um, because what's there, the inventory of, of uh, facilities, isn't really what the market is looking for. So uh, about two years ago, we started an investigation into what we we're calling the Hartwell North Initiative to work with consultants, stakeholders in the area to understand what is more appealing. How do we get higher value from the facilities that are out there that will generate more dynamic commercial enterprises and more revenue for the community. This isn't a, you know, there's, there's no quick fix. Right. This uh, uh, isn't going to turn over overnight. Uh, and it's something that has to be done in close collaboration with the community to make sure we're addressing the neighborhood problems around there. As you know, Hartwell Avenue, Bedford, the jug handle, that area, traffic is a real challenge. Right. And any growth has to simultaneously address those issues because you're not going to get developers building even if you right. change the zoning. If you can't improve the flow, right. it, it's not going to generate any more, uh, any more value there. So this is a process that we've started and that is really important for us as we look forward at these capital challenges. We're looking at 
the existing set of, of schools we're building and, and the high school is in the pipeline for um, some form of, of redevelopment, either addition, renovation, reconstruction, whatever it is, is going to be a financial challenge. It's going to be a lot of money. So it, what we're looking for is how can we get more revenue from a broader range than just our residential payers. Um, we're also looking at our other zones. We want to keep things like the center, a vital place where people are, are right. excited to go right. and, and keep our community spirit. Right. I know we, last year we created a new zone, a CSX zone, um, to deal with the, the issues over there at um, Merritt Road, the Merritt Road area. I'm not right. talking about Merritt Merit Square. Merritt Spring. Merritt and Spring. Um, so that the landlord, the new landlord there can, and I understand he's having pretty good luck bringing in new tenants, so, um, which is a good thing. And, um, but the, the, the use was very, you know, it, it was confusing. You could have a certain business on one side of the street, yet directly across the street you couldn't do it, that same business. Um, and it was just crazy. It was, um, it was a difficult time for the previous owner, I know that, but the new owner came through and I think Tom Meeting heard his appeal and the board heard his appeal and I think it, it all worked out. And I think that CSX zone is, is something um, that will help us in other parts of the town too as we begin to look at you know, issues relative to, to com you know, retail. Right. So I, so I think it's uh, one of the things that's going on right now is the comprehensive plan, right. which uh, the last time we did was 15 years ago. As we were supposed to do it every 10 years, so we're a little late in, in redoing it. But looking at how we change as a community, because we always change, even if it seems similar, right. there are changes. The comprehensive plan is bringing together the community as a whole to talk about what our vision is for our, ourselves right. for the next 20 years and thinking about how do these zones fit together. Because it's not just, the, you know, we talked about the, the uh, property owner in the CSX district. Um, it's great that he's able to lease, but it's even better that he's providing service and interest for the community as a whole, for Lexington as a whole, and the neighborhood. Uh, when you have idle real estate and, and buildings that are going, uh, are deteriorating, right. that's, that's not good for anybody. Right. Let me ask you, and, and this is just sort of, you know, from the hip, if you will, um, and, I, and I discussed this with somebody a little earlier. We have some vacancies in, in the center, the tavern that's gone vacant for a long time. People are always asking, what's going on with the tavern? Like, just like they did with what happened, what's going on with the co-host lo location mm -hmm. that turned into Panera, and in the, the end result was really, really very good for our, for our downtown and our community. Um, it was floated that... Um, some communities have some sort of a, like a penalty for landlords, and I hate to use the word penalty, but that's what it is, for keeping properties on the market and not being aggressive and looking for tenants uh, for whatever reason, whether they're being paid by another resource, the rent's being paid, so therefore they're not all that, you know, uh, not interested, but they don't feel the, the pressure to get somebody in there. Is, is that, a, is that are we opening a dangerous door by talking about something like that? Um. So I, I don't think it's a dangerous door. I, th um, I think we need to look at all sorts of doors to make sure we remain a vital community and that we, right. we look at how do you keep um, revenue sources flowing. But I'll, I'll, I, one of the towns that has adopted a, a policy like this, or actually I think it was a bylaw, is Arlington. Mm -hmm. It's not nearly as uh, onerous as you might think. Uh, what it requires is for um, the property owner to inform the town when their leases are idle, when it's a vacant lot. Um, that way the town can help, the Economic Development Office can help try to find uses. Um, and and it, the penalties are a relatively low fine, which can be waived if the um, a property owner activates the space. So for example, if it's a storefront, if they put local artwork in the storefront to keep it interesting, mm -hmm. then the, the fee is, uh, is waived. Right. Um, and that is sort of a win-win. It, it makes sure that we have uh, the more people looking to see how to get tenants into this area, and it makes the idle space still attractive and not appear to be uh, a, an eyesore for the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it's something to, to consider. Um, 
I, just, I will say that this yeah. is not on the table this year. No, I understand. Um, no, no, right. I'm just, that's why I say I'm from the hip. Right. It crossed my mind. Um, we were thinking about, you know, uh, I'm just thinking about, uh, as you know, I'm the chairman of the right. Chamber of Commerce, and I'm asked all the time. And I'm sure there's an answer to the question, because I think something is going on. There's some discussion about something in there, but I, I'm, I don't know. But the, but the bigger question is, how long do we allow these vacancies to exist? Um, you know, I do know we now have, uh, we've changed the, the, the by, uh, is it, I think it's a bylaw on banks and real estate offices, right. you know, that basically it's by special permit. They have to come in front of, uh, was it the Board of Appeals or the Board of Selectmen? Uh, it's, so it's a zoning bylaw and it, uh, uh, I think it's the Board of Appeals, it's not the Selectmen. Not the Selectmen, okay. The, uh, so it's not our jurisdiction. Um, <laughs> That's one fight you don't want to have, thankfully. Um, uh, it's not a ban. What it right. is, is to limit density of right. um, like spaces that are largely office use, right. like a bank or real estate. Um, and if there are too many too close to each other, you can't add one. Right. Um, so it, it's not a complete prohibition, but it's an attempt to keep us from having every other storefront be either a bank or a, a real estate office. Right. Um, um, okay. Well, good. I just, you know, it's just a, a thought because I just, I, you know, I know folks in the business community are, you know, they're, they're concerned because they do want, you know, a rising tide raises all ships. So when everybody's working together and we have these, these store vacancies filled, it's, a, it's just a good thing. And I know it's, it's hard for you guys to sort of micromanage that stuff and you really don't. We but, don't. Right. right. You don't. But it's... Um, you know, it's one of those things that I just hope is on at least the radar screen. So. Right, and, and, and what I hope for is that we're actually creating incentives for positive change right. rather than uh, creating a lot of uh, I agree. penalties. I agree. Um, quickly, I want to talk about, um, we were talking about the Economic Development Office. Over the last several years, the, the tourism has become a big part of sort of f uh, the focus of the town. Um, I think it's been finally determined that there is quantifiable evidence that tourism is having some positive economic impact on the community and the town has been really sort of rolling up its sleeves and working in tandem with the tourism committee and others to really foster the growth of tourism. Um, where are you on that? Uh, well, I've been a tourist. <laughs> <laughs> a tourist in your own town? Uh, well, yeah. I, so I've, I've you've gone. Been to, you've I've, you've I've been to Buckman Tavern. I've and taken the tours, and uh, and I enjoy going to uh, uh, the the Battle Green, and uh, and I certainly am a consumer at our restaurants. Yes. Uh, on a regular basis, but um, uh, so tourism is is a fact of life. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a historical resource here as a community, and it is a draw for. Uh, both national interest and international. We have a lot of international visitors. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's not really a question of, you know, where are you on it? it it's yeah. there. Um, and I think that... Um, but I guess the question is, you know, are you all in? In other words, you know, for, for years it was just sort of, it was there, it was in the background, but there's been more of a focus on supporting it, bringing in, um, you know, taking over the visitor center and, and running that. Um, marketing more um, through the through the committee, you know, designating staff time in the economic development office to spend more time promoting tourism. So I, I guess that's what I mean by where are you on this? Is this a good thing? So one of the things that I think was really good was that um, um, a lot of the tourism initiatives were coming out of the tourism committee, and they are a group of volunteers who have done a, an outstanding job for the town. But day-to-day -day operational responsibilities shouldn't be in the hands of volunteers. Right. So one of the things that we did, and, and I worked on this a lot as, as chair of the board, was to bring multiple stakeholders together and move more responsibility into the economic development um, office in, on town staff to supervise and be responsible for moving forward our uh, tourism initiatives. That said, the economic development office is looking at all of our economic development right. and the the largest effect from a taxpayer basis is really our commercial real right. estate. Right. Uh, so Hartwell Avenue has to be the primary focus, um, but tourism right. clearly is providing a um, uh, an economic engine for our small businesses, primarily food establishments, right. coffee shops, um, but. There's also small retail in the center that is benefiting significantly from the tourists right. visiting us. We're coming to close to the time that we have to end, so I'm going to.
kind of run through some of these issues. Um, uh, we did streetscape and accessibility, but town meeting is coming up. And there are a lot of issues coming up uh, into town meeting. One of the more interesting ones is of sort of almost like a, it's akin to the plastic bag uh, ban, for lack of a better word. Um, and um, there are a group of folks who are looking to now sort of push the initiative forward to ban plastic straws, plastic cutlery, mm -hmm. um, and um, some other related uh, items. I don't know, wh what do you think about that? What do you, wh wh do you know, do you think that they're, you know, what they're bringing, is, is that, a, is it an overreach or is, is there a happy medium? Is there a discussion to be had? So there's a discussion to be had for sure. Um, I, it, it's, it's a little too early right now to, for me to be able to tell you, is it the right solution? Because we don't really have fully the language. Right, and right. what's more, the, the, so, so the, there are two different articles. They're both uh, citizens' articles, which are not brought by the Board of Select or town committees. Right. They're brought by citizens who want to address an issue at town meeting. Right. The um, one was brought initially by a group of Girl Scouts. Um, that's the plastic straw ban. They, um, they're really concerned with the proliferation of litter. And as you know, there are a number of national chains that are moving away from using right. um, the single-use plastic straws. So they are leveraging those directions to try to create regulatory control in Lexington. Um, what, when they presented to us, we were thrilled to have this group of Girl Scouts and, and, right. and adult leaders with them. Um, we, 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 we talked to them about the need to go and reach out to the merchants and um, commercial entities that would be affected by this to understand how best to go forward. That's the part of, there's right. still a conversation. Um, you know, clearly the, the national chains are dealing with this because this, isn't, this is happening in multiple places. Right. There are alternatives, but how well they work for some of the smaller local shops is, is unknown to me. I hope we can find something that is workable, mm -hmm. and um, because there is clearly a problem with waste in, right. in, for this kind of material. Sure. Similarly, the the second one came from uh, the green teams right. in town, and that was about polystyrene. Polystyrene, right? And, the containers uh, and such. Right. Those are containers, but they're also uh, plastic uh, cutlery oh, is right. made out okay. of. Right. So there's the, the the foamy polystyrene, and then there's a different form. Uh, in both cases, there are alternatives, and the issue is for to work out with um, the local community, how do you get to those alternatives? I know with plastic uh, bags, we enacted the bylaw and said for large um, retailers, it would go in effect on January 1st the next year, and small retailers had a longer period of time. There was also... To deplete the, 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 you know... Right, right. you want to make sure that people pile. aren't just throwing away the stock they have. Right. They want to use it effectively, and then transition to using And we were able better. to discuss with, with, the, with the team of folks, um, we affectionately referred to as the bag ladies. Uh, <laughs> I <laughs> didn't I hear it at the time, I'm glad I didn't. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, they, um, they, they, they liked it, so I wouldn't use it otherwise. Right, but, um, but like I say, it's affectionate. The, um, but they were, were willing to sit with us and talk about the, the thickness of the bags. They were originally looking for four mils. We got them down to like, I think, 2.25 2. Right. or something. That was acceptable. And, um, you know, it's a good start. And I already see it going. I'm going to places where there are no bags, plastic bags available. So I'm already seeing it there. Um, quickly, I wanted to, you know, a little bit about what's interesting coming up in town meeting. And then we're going to sort of go to uh, a closing because sure. we're going a little long. Uh, so uh, it, this year is a little unusual. There are 10 citizens' articles. Um, I think there's a lot of um, uh, civic engagement, which is great. I mean, just similarly, there are a lot of contested town meeting seats mm -hmm. for town meeting members, which is a rare occurrence. And uh, so I'm really enthusiastic. Some of the things we'll be seeing are, are sustainability-related. Um, there's one article looking to um, fund a position for a sustainability director in town. Um, there's um, a, uh, a citizen's article looking to um, uh, consider the um, uh, CPA surcharge. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another citizen's article looking for us to develop a, an economic strategy and fund a consultant. So they're, they're all over the board. I think mm -hmm. they reflect a lot of the issues that the community is facing. We are, we are looking at growth. We're looking at environmental concerns. And we're looking at budgetary concerns. So you will get 
the standard set of articles that come for the budget, schools, right. um, capital expenses. As you mentioned, we'll be uh, there is an article, um, or one of the capital articles is about um, uh, funding construction of the center streetscape. Right. So um, I, there are aren't quite as many articles as there are some years as thirty nine, mm -hmm. um, but I think we'll have a, a really good set of discussions this right. year. Some robust debate. Right. Well, thank you for coming. I, I'd like you to t you know talk um, to the folks of Lexington about you know why um, why you'd like to serve another term. Why is it that you're why, why would you do this to yourself? I'm <laughs> just kidding. I know you do a great job. You really have. And I can see your passion in everything you do. And, and it's, it's really been a pleasure watching you serve on the board. But in closing, why don't you just talk to the folks about why you're looking forward to another term? Thank you. I appreciate those comments. Yeah. Uh, so I'm running for my third term um, because I really love Lexington and I'm looking to continue facing the challenges we have in front of us and bringing a a cohesive, coordinated, communal response to that as we go forward. We are going to have a lot of challenges as we look at a growth in, in our budget, but as a community, an inclusive community, I think we can really do a good job of making the future work for us all. I'm dedicated to making sure that when I say the future works for us all, I'm also thinking about our, our global responsibility in, in making sure that as we modify, build buildings, et cetera, that we're thinking about how we make them sustainable, resilient, our, our healthy environment inside of them. But mostly I'm here because I want us to remain the kind of community where we all engage actively with a positive goal and outcome. So thank you for having elected me twice and I look forward to uh, being reelected this year and serving for my third term. Well, thank you. Thanks for being with us. Appreciate it.